Solamente es una presentación muy breve de la siguiente charla de Liam Young. Liam Young eh, nos acompaña como parte de un proyecto apoyado por Fundación Telefónica, que como, como muchos de ustedes saben y he dicho algunas veces, es parte fundamental de lo que hemos hecho en Visiones Sonoras en el CEMAS en general y en Visiones Sonoras en particular ya por muchos años. La Fundación, de, Fundación Telefónica en varios países, pero en México en particular, ha sido un apoyo muy, muy importante para las actividades, tanto de los conciertos, de las residencias, de la parte de investigación y publicaciones que hemos hecho a lo largo de, de mucho tiempo aquí. Y siempre en Visiones Sonoras nos, eh, nos gusta trabajar con ellos para, para poder tener participantes que vienen un poquito desde la perspectiva de afuera del, del sonido y la música, pero que estén directamente vinculados con la temática, que este es el caso especial de, de Liam, al cual le agradecemos muchísimo la, la, pues la facilidad para estar con nosotros, que está haciendo un proyecto más grande con Fundación Telefónica. Él me parece que está en Los Ángeles, desde donde está haciendo la presentación. Y bueno, efectivamente, de agradecerle mucho a Bárbara, a Javier y a Nidia, Nidia eh, eh, de Fundación Telefónica, su confianza y sobre todo el apoyo para todas las cosas que hacemos aquí en el CEMAS. Entonces, esta charla, eh, Liam, I don't know how's your Spanish. Uh, If you can follow, but I, I was just thanking you, a Fundación Telefónica, for uh, for the support for everything we do here at the Mexican Center for Music and Sonic Arts, which is where we are doing the festival, and uh, thanking you for for being able to share with us your work and this project that we are really looking forward to to seeing. And uh, of course, it's there, there's a few minutes at the end we can have questions and I can translate or whatever is needed. So um, thanks very much. Can you, can you see my, my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Um, thank you. And hi, everyone. And I, I wish I could be there, but unfortunately, I'm uh, trapped over here in LA. So we'll have to do this via Zoom. I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with this format after three years of a global pandemic. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's great to be Zooming into this room. Uh, so, um, I'm, my name is Liam Young, and um, I tell stories with and about space. I'm a speculative architect, and I guess that means that, you know, I don't really design buildings, but instead I make films, I build imaginary worlds for the entertainment industry, and, and really I tell stories about the global, urban, and architectural implications of new technologies. So, whether it be through projects like the one we're discussing uh, today or world building for film and TV here in LA, what we do is we use imagined fictional worlds as a site in which to explore important ideas, not just to sell tickets or to create a backdrop for a kind of superhero moment, but, but rather we're interested in the ways that fiction is an extraordinary shared language. It's how our culture has always shared and disseminated ideas. And we're all literate in stories and narratives of imagined worlds can often help us to visualize other possible futures that sit outside of the futures that sometimes feel all too inescapable and inevitable. So these stories are both products of culture, but at the same time, they also can help to produce culture. So as we write stories, we can also imagine how we might begin to rewrite the world. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I, I try and find my talks not as slideshows or PowerPoint presentations, but rather as illustrated narrative, as kind of um, storytelling experiences that are woven together from documentaries that I've made, but also the science fiction films that we've constructed. So. Hopefully the next 30 minutes will be a sort of cinematic drift through a screenscape of imagined worlds. And particularly today, what I want to do is, is tell um, two stories. Well, a, a story about two cities, at least. Um, two cities that fit the entire population of the Earth. One that is entirely fictional and one that currently we all already occupy. Um, so I'm going to... Um, uh, kind of mute my camera so you can focus on the images on the screen. 
Um, it's going to be hopefully full of sound, and um, I'm going to try and narrate the story as we go through. Uh, I, I hope that the everyone in the room, the organizers, you can you can turn down the lights so it feels much more like a cinematic experience. And um, I'll see you all on the other side, and we can have a conversation and um, ask questions. Um, hopefully, you're going to be hearing the sound uh, from the film as well. Um, if you, if you don't hear the sound, please someone. Um, Stop me and uh, and I'll stop the video and we'll figure out the technical issues. But hopefully we can get the technical issues to to work for us today and um, you'll enjoy the journey. So with that said, let's fire up the autonomous electric AI mega drone hyperdrives and uh, let's get on moving through Planet City and uh, the return of, of global wilderness. All cities are fictions. Their literal edges are nebulous and their physical definition is endlessly being rewritten. But in many ways, their boundaries come into focus as shared narratives. The fiction of a city can weigh as much as its physical shadow. They are lived and occupied, read and watched with consequence and meaning. I am a director and architect, and I tell stories about cities, some real and some imagined. The urban imaginary has always been a site in which to prototype new scenarios and emerging cultures. In their speculative streets, we play out multiple, unexpected, unintended futures in their associated social and political ideologies. Whether it be speculation around the impacts of industrialization and mass production, the imminent arrival of driverless cars, seamless augmented reality or artificial intelligence, these fictional worlds give form to our most wondrous technological possibilities and gravest concerns. The Ecumenopolis, or planet-wide city, has long been a narrative of science fiction. The term was coined in 1967 to describe the narrative concept of total planetary urbanization. Across the history of imaginary cities, amongst others, the worldwide city has taken on the form of the sprawl in William Gibson's trilogy, a world without trees and silent running, and Trantor, a planet entirely of architecture in Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. Today, the Ecumenopolis is no longer a fiction, however. We are all already citizens of a planetary city. Following centuries of colonization, globalization, and never-ending economic extraction, we have remade the world from the scale of the cell to the tectonic plate. Urban development has forever changed the composition of the atmosphere, the oceans, and the earth. There is no city and country anymore, no nature or technology. Instead, we have engineered a continuous urban construct that stretches across the entirety of the earth. It is an unevenly distributed megastructure that hides in plain sight. It wasn't master planned by a single imperial power or a cyberpunk mega corporation. It was slowly stitched together from stolen lands by planetary logistics, where landscapes have become resource fields, countries have become factory floors, the countryside has become industrialized agriculture, 
and the oceans have become conveyor belts. The dystopias of science fiction that previously read as speculative, cautionary tales are now the stage sets for the everyday as we live out our lives in a disaster film that's playing in real time. Any aspiration or distant future has given way to the critical re-narration of the dystopian present. The future is broken, and we are left stranded in the long now, staring at empty calendars, doom-strolling idly, waiting for the end of the end of the world. In this moment without a future, as a slow-motion catastrophe envelops us at a speed that makes it uncomfortable to ignore, I want to tell a story about another planet city. A counter-narrative. A story about a concentrated city for the entire population of the Earth. The anti-city to the sprawl we all inhabit. This talk is a story of these two cities. Two cities the size of the planet. A city symphony, a portrait of places stitched together from fragments of science fiction films that I've made with my production company here in LA, and scenes from a series of narrative documentaries we have shot around the world with the documentary studio Unknown Fields that I run from London with Kate Davies. Slipping between fiction and documentary, it will be a sci-fi safari between these two cities. One that is already here, and another that will never exist. As we begin, we are standing in Planet City. A single city for 10 billion people. The projected global population of 2050. We can hear the hums and crackles of flickering blue and red LEDs that illuminate the lower reaches of the city's farm fields. It smells of soil and hard drives and sweet fruit. A purple sunrise over a new kind of wild. Seminal biologist Edward O. Wilson imagined a new world he called Half Earth. It was a plan to stave off mass extinction by devoting half the surface of the Earth completely to nature. For Wilson, the magnitude of the problems that face us are far too large to be tackled with small gestures and any solution must respond to this scale and urgency. The byproduct of Wilson's global park is the massive consolidation of our existing cities and lifestyles that would be required to withdraw to the remaining 50% of Earth. Would we be willing to make such an extraordinary change? What would our lives in this new world order look like? This speculation is where Planet City begins. What if we were to redesign and visualize this radical reversal of our planetary sprawl? Such extraordinary crises require the most radical and bold responses. 
How far could we push Wilson's proposal to save the Earth? In its most provocative form, if we were to reorganize our world at the intensity of the densest cities that currently exist, then Planet City could occupy as little as 0.02% Earth. Could we imagine a global consensus to retreat from our vast network of cities and entangled supply chains into this one hyperdense metropolis? Our planetary city is an extraordinary constellation of products, goods, and technologies. From the smallest and most inconsequential of objects to the most intricate and complex, these material things set in motion a vast planetary scale infrastructure. In a world of bytes and bitcoins, cyberspace and clouds, 90% of the world's cargo still travels by sea. It's not beamed or teleported or conjured into existence along strings of fiber optics, but rather it's dragged across the planet in heaving steel megaships. Because it's filled with glistening gadgets and gizmos, refined geologies wrenched from the earth and scattered to the sea. The global shipping fleet connects the massive mining excavations distributed on the edge of the world the sites where our planetary city begins and ends its life. In our imaginary planet city, we imagine the world shipping fleet that has been used to scatter matter ripped from the earth across the storefronts of our global streets has been reversed to bring that material back together again as scenes of planetary culture and architecture performed through the geological strata of the city. To build our new city, we mined the old ones rather than virgin ground. Piece by piece, we will dismantle the world we once knew and recast it in new configurations. One by one, we arrived in a global citizen consensus a voluntary and multi-generational retreat from the world we once knew. A deafening roar sometimes begins with just the softest whisper. In the distance, out on the uneven edges of our planetary city is the lithium triangle, the electric earth that will soon power our world. If we were to stage such a retreat, it would mean reimagining landscapes like this one. This tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds cuts through a region of Chile, Bolivia and Argentina and contains almost all of the world's lithium resources, the key ingredient in all of our batteries. Our collective dreams of a renewable planet, the prophecies and profiteering of tech evangelist Elon Musk are all buried here, beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. The indigenous population that belongs to this land tell a creation story of lithium, they talk of the tears and breast milk of a mythic volcano that is mixed together to crystallize into this lithium lake. The massive mining landscape carved out of one of the rarest and most precious ecosystems on the planet is the geology enacted when you power your laptop or slide your slimline phone into your pocket. Although it sits well beyond the horizon of towering buildings and dense streets of the cities that most of us currently inhabit, it is a product of the city and in turn produces the city. It is a landscape hidden in the stretching shadows, disguised, ignored, forgotten, invisible in the ad for the latest Apple Eye everything or the hype of the Hyperloop. We power our city with the breast milk of volcanoes. In 
In our imaginary planet city, the bright white of the lithium salt flats fades into pink, the beta carotene of the city's algae canals. These are the batteries of planet city, alive with fish and algae. As excess wind and solar power pumps water through canals to high altitude holding lakes in the city's upper floors. Lithium batteries are replaced by the potential energy of elevated water bodies, snaking amongst the towers. Before dawn, thousands of autonomous cleaning blades squeak along the solar fields. Waves of mirrors ripple as they rotate to chase the changing light. A billion panels, collected from all over the world, charges the city canals. When needed, the dams open and the turbines turn. Tides rise and fall as lights glow, televisions blare and hard drive spin. The lights of the city farms flicker on. We are not precious about where we get our light. A synthetic sun casts purple shadows, yet still warms the skin and helps fertilize the soil. The blue and red spectrum of light is the most efficient for growth. The stacked farms funnel in the city's carbon. It is a sequestration and scrubbing unit, the byproduct of which is food for the city. Beyond the planet city walls, in the other city, deep in the snowy Siberian Ural Mountains, the cucumbers of the double glazed indoor farms no, no seasonal boundaries. 600 watt sodium bulbs run across the ceiling in measured rows of artificial suns. The simulated sky turns off at 8 a.m. and back on at 2 p.m. as an automated, accelerated day is programmed to induce faster growth. A group of neighbors overlooking the farm save on their electricity bills by leaving their lights off in the evening and opening their curtains to the cucumbers illuminated below. Our existing planetary city turns day to night and night to day, populating our stores with goods across a singular, endless planetary season. We chase the seasons through the height of the city, Vertical orchards weave through the tower's 160 floors. Between them, birds migrate across climate zones, while shepherds herd the harvest box and nomadic neighborhoods follow the pattern of the fruit blooms. A young Indian textile worker walks the planetary city cotton fields. The water of the city pours in. These landscapes produce the $3 t-shirt, an icon of the existing modern city. Fast fashion's rolling tide dumps mountains of cheap clothing onto our shores. Objects of desire, worn for one wild night and destined to be discarded. If we were to pick at a loose thread and unravel it to cross the planetary city, we would be traveling from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of the landscapes behind our runway dreams and street blue jeans. Before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of tens of thousands of miles in their process of production, making textiles the most globalized industry in the planetary city. The byproduct of this pace and scale of production is the destruction of the very thing that brought this industry to Southeast Asia originally. In the existing planetary city, we meet the last generation of master weavers, a group whose skills now die with them. 
The apprentices they would once train now man the rumbling, mechanized looms of global fashion. Raw cotton plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist lovingly tweaking the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic, cheap and fake yarns used by all the other companies around him. Slowly, she walks through the row of plants on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry supply chain where she works. As she walks across the city, she is gradually wrapped in the glistening gold textile, bearing witness to a series of transformations like weaving, dyeing, sewing, and pressing. Her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk, but also the walk how disposable fashion takes in its process of global production, and the path so many women like her have taken in moving from village to factory to city. Her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will export her and everything she wears to the center of the planet city. As we move through our other city, the costumes we encounter are crafted from zero waste patterns and woven on computer-controlled looms. There is no offcuts. There is no material lost. All fibers are reformed from old fabrics, pulped up and compressed into felts or stitched together. No new resources are expended to dress the citizens of Planet City. We watch as they join in a different kind of continuous procession. An endless festival dancing its way through the city on a 365-day loop. Each day it intersects with another carnival, culture or celebration, changing the beat as it goes, cycling through new colours, costumes and cacophonies. The ghosts of nation-states give way to communities formed around shared cultural practices as we perform new stories and myths of care belonging and recreation. The majority of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. This film is a portrait of these digging machines who excavate the majority of the world's gemstones. In these illegal mines, it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. A hidden black market supply chain connects two choreographies, one in these lawless mine sites and the other in the jewellery stores, hip-hop music videos and celebrity red carpets in the cities that are all familiar to us. Here the movements are traced like the early photographic studies of Frank Gilbraith, who is mapping the choreographies of the production line, looking to optimise every movement, constrain every motion, with the elegance of a tuned engine. The digger is imagined as a robot, the body repurposed as a machine, just one component in the gemstone conveyor belt that stretches across the earth.
The technologies once designed to optimize the global production lines are now operating at urban scales. We are endlessly scanned by countless sensors, lasers, cameras and satellites feeding the city operating system. This, for example, is how our autonomous vehicles scan and navigate the city. They see it as these 3D point clouds. Across a single night, a group of teenagers drift through the imaginary planet city in a driverless taxi. And they move in explosive contortions as they invent a new choreography that distorts the silhouette and disguises the proportions of their frame so as to evade body detection algorithms that are now used by the city surveillance cameras. It's a new vocabulary of movement, exuberant in plain sight, but through the eyes of the machine, two bodies become one, entangled with fractured limbs, fuzzy frames and lost connections. They are part of an underground rave community that adorn themselves in machine vision camouflage textiles. And they reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate of Moore's law or the latest phone model or software update rather than a change in a natural season. And their iridescent textiles reflect the light of CCTV laser scans as they dance in the hidden spaces of the city. They hack the city, creating exuberant glitches and distortions and disturbances in the data set, searching for the wilds beyond the machine. The existing planet city attempts to identify our bodies. Protesters hurl bricks and tear gas burns the eyes. It's illegal to wear masks. And now gate detection algorithms scan the body as their faces are wrapped in masks to keep the tear gas from burning their eyes and to keep their faces hidden from the cameras. The global infrastructures of our planet city are also digital. Systems of AI governance, the management of the city that was once publicly elected is now outsourced to proprietary software systems and large-scale tech companies. And public services has disappeared into the fog of the cloud. We are not citizens, but rather customers in this planetary city. In our future planet city, we hear from a real chatbot that we trained on city data sets and urban management protocols. This is the city operating system, and it's reading a love letter it wrote, a message to the citizens it affectionately manages, an autonomous city of machines where the sky is filled with drones, cars are driverless, the street is draped in augmented reality and everyone is connected to everything. I
노래를 불러드릴까요? 
Hi, everyone. Uh, and we're back. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thanks. OK, excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was beautiful. And um, we have a few minutes for uh, questions or comments from, from the audience. Si hay alguien que quiera hacer una pregunta, if there's someone who has a comment or a question, we, uh, we have a few minutes. Tendríamos que hacerla en el micrófono, nada más para que la pueda escuchar Liam. Y si es necesario traducirla, yo la traduzco con mucho gusto. No sé si, is there any comments, questions? Or uh, Liam, you wanted to say something, or would you rather wait for comments? Uh, I think I've done enough talking already. Maybe okay. um, if anyone's got something they want to say, uh, then uh, we, could, we should make space for that. Okay. Alguien que tenga alguna pregunta o comentario? Everyone is quiet and peaceful. <laughs> Nada. Alguna queja, alguna propuesta? There's one. Yeah. They'll do it through the mic, so you, you'll be able well, to. Have you heard? Okay. Firstly, is I'm going to find a quiet corner and slash my wrist. Closer. Okay, yeah. I was just going to say that the first thing I'm going to do is find a quiet corner and slash my wrists, I think. Um, but on a serious note, what part the capitalist system has in all this? Because it was really heartbreaking to see that human conveyor belt uh, um, as well as all the other things that, that were portrayed there. I mean, it's a really tough view, and uh, it does need to be seen. But but I, I just wonder about the, the capitalist ethic that, that's behind a lot of this. I mean, I, I know we consume. I've got my mobile phone with its lithium battery, but uh, there's also a lot of extraction that goes somewhere else. Perhaps ask the people at Davos. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I mean... Goodness, I hope you don't go and uh, cut yourself into pieces. Um, uh, there was supposed to be some kind of redemption there. But I think, uh, I, mean, I mean, it goes without saying, really, that um, where we are today is a result of the extraordinary global success of capitalism as an ideology. Um, and I guess my work um, right now is, is really concerned with trying to um, help imagine and create fictions that might suggest um, alternative models for a future. Um, notwithstanding Mark Fisher's capitalist realism, you know, the, the almost impossibility to see beyond um, capitalism as a project due to its extraordinary success. Um, what we need is radical visions of, of, of other possibilities that perhaps rewire such a system. Um, the problem is right now that most of the accepted visions of aspirational or utopian futures are still rooted in the environmentalist ideals of, of baby boomer model, right? That, that we've seen um, are, are totally flawed and um, have failed. Right? Like this, this idea that the only sustainable future is one rooted in a new reimagining of localism. Um, it's community gardens in Brooklyn. It's people growing tomatoes on roofs. It's um, a return to like, you know, a, a model where individual choice to, to drive an electric car or to you know, power your home by solar panels on the roof is the, is the only way forward in that all dystopian models of futures are rooted in scales that are global and planetary. You know, the Bond villain, the, the evil tech billionaire, they operate at planetary scales, but the, um, the utopian operates at the scale of a neighborhood farm. Um, I think that's really problematic. You know, like, like again, that, that model is rooted in a very dated version of what environmentalism looks like. Um, and that kind of investment in the individualism has actually been what has kind of formed a lot of the problems that we've created today. 
Um, so what we're trying to do in Planet City is the, the first part of that, but um, is is imagine new visions of possible futures that understand and take as a departure point the extraordinary planetary scale infrastructural systems that we've created for ourselves. Um, and not seeing them as being um, a binary opposite to sustainability, but actually holding the promise of another way forward. You know, what we're what we've seen in, in across our generation is um, you know, you know the, the the development of of extraordinary modern wonders of the world. Um, the, 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 the implementation of solar energy networks and wind power systems, um, hydroelectric plants, the, the very slow turn off of coal burning power stations in China, for instance, like um, there's huge infrastructural leaps that we've been making. Um, at the same time, we've been bemoaning that our generation doesn't have a moon land, you know, um, doesn't have a grand project. Um, but really, or out on these industrial peripheries, we've been remaking the world. Um, and although you know, I would I would put a very real note of caution there that that the fossil fuel lobby is still extraordinarily powerful. We have now created technologies that can realistically dig us out of the hole that we've created for ourselves. The problem is we're just not turning them on. We're not investing in them at scales that become meaningful. Um, but we are in a situation where climate change is no longer a technological problem. You know, we've, we've, we're not waiting for some billionaire to, to, to create a new thing that's going to solve these problems. A lot of the technologies that are required to, to solve these issues have been around for 10 or 15 years. Col climate change is now a political problem, an ideological problem, a cultural problem. And that in one sense is really disturbing because there's no signs that culturally or politically, we're, we're, we're moving to a point where we might be able to change these things. But at the same time, it's hopeful because if we wanted to, we could tomorrow, you know? Um, so, I don't know, it's a very measured, pragmatic um, uh, optimism that I have, but it's a kind of optimism nonetheless. We have time for one more. Can you do it on the mic? Well, thank you. I re really enjoyed the, the movie uh, in a slightly weirded out, uh, uh, poetically dystopian uh, way. Um, as you know, this festival, there are lots of artists here engaging with climate themes and environmental themes in various ways. And had a very interesting discussion with someone yesterday on the topic of whether it should be the purpose of art to try to change society's views and bring about change in, in, let's say, the environment by making people reflect more on what's happening, or um, whether it's the purpose of art to be art, to be imaginative and creative and to exist and to fulfill artistic aims. Now, clearly, that's a spectrum you know, between those two extremes of, of the kind of pragmatic message-conveying form and just the be being creative. I just wonder where your work um, sits on that spectrum and all kind of possibilities between those two um, where, where what you're doing now um, where do you where do you see yourself between those two those two extremes yeah i mean like to be honest i think any artist or any creator who's not radically concerned with um the dire condition that we all occupy right now um uh isn't really making work you know like that they're just, they're just tinkering around with the deck chairs um, as, as, as the thing is, is, is um, on its way to an iceberg. Um, uh, like, I think it's our responsibility to make work that, that somehow contributes to this. Like, like what that contribution looks like um, is, a, is another kind of question. But I think there's a really important role that, that, that you know, um, these types of work, storytelling, art, can play in shaping, as I've just been talking about, like a new cultural imaginary. Like um, the future really is a project again. Um, and what we're missing is, is viable um, real alternatives. And I think that's part of art's role is to, 
is to you know, culturally lay the foundations and, and start to give form to what some of those aspirations and visions could be. Um, you know, otherwise it's just some kind of decadent luxury industry that's making trinkets for rich people. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I hope that, like that's not to say that like, you know, art you know, all needs to be operationalized and like, you know, like we need to like literally put real proposals forward like, oh, here's a, like Planet City is not a, is not a proposal that's literally meant to be implemented, but rather it's a provocation to talk about the ways that um, the, 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 the real kind of fiction, the core of that project is business as usual. And, and the fact that we can continue to imagine our cities the way that we do, like that's the, that's the, um, that's the core of the project is, is that, um, you know, the, the ludicrous way that we would be making our current cities, never mind the, the proposals identified one in one place. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, you know, it's a real working model of what that hyperdense city could look like. It, it, it's, a, it's born out of a whole lot of collaborations with scientists and technologists and, and, and theorists that, that have developed a, uh, what, what is a working model. Um, as I mean to say that if we can get things working at that scale, at the scale of 10 billion people, there's nothing stopping us reimagining a city like London, or Los Angeles, or Mexico City. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's it's meant to generate a conversation around it. And, and it's and it's those kind of conversations that we that we need to be having. Because again, I, I I don't think there's a shared value system that we're currently operating. Um, there isn't really a consensus about what. The futures we want to live in look like. Never mind the steps put in place in order to get there. In in, in politics, we're still arguing over whether or not climate change is is human induced or not. Um, um, we've seen the total failure of nation states in doing anything meaningful. Um, so, uh, you know, the role of culture is is I think um, inevitably trying to fill that 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 gap in in vision. Um, so yeah, I think I think now is it, it, it's more critical than ever that we're making that we're making work, and and that, that the role and, and the value of that work is has sharply been brought into focus um, across across the pandemic. So it really is, you know, if anything works like this, that hopefully I've been presenting are, are meant to be understood as a call to arms, not to invest in any singular future that I might be putting forward, but rather um, to suggest that everyone needs to be kind of engaging with the future as a project. You know, the future should be understood as a verb, not a noun. It's something that we all actively do as opposed to something that's either being sold to us or that just um, kind of is going to happen to us. So um, hopefully, you know, there's ways of thinking about multiple authors of multiple kinds of futures um, as, as part of the, um, the, the, the next few years of, of cultural production. Well, thanks very much, Liam. It's been it's been great, and um, well, thanks for your time and effort, everything, and just a uh, goodbye from Mexico City. Thanks. thanks. Well, I I will be here. Um, my uh, show opens in um, uh, is traveling from Lima to Mexico City and opens in June, so I'll be in person in Mexico City, um, doing more talks hopefully, and uh, you see some of the work in person. Yeah, this um, is uh, part of, a, but, but, esta es parte de la preparación de Fundación Telefónica para la exposición de Liam que se va a presentar en México en junio. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Bueno, eh, hay un pequeño error en, la, en el programa como está en la página. Eh, porque el horario está correcto, pero está incorrecto el orden como está puesto. Ahora viene la plática de Duncan eh, Pinas.